Welcome to the InfoWars Nightly News. Today's date is Thursday, May 23rd, 2013. I'm your host, Rob Dew, and here's a look at some of our top stories. Tonight on the InfoWars Nightly News, Obama himself admits Americans have been killed in drone strikes. For this week, I authorized the declassification of this action and the deaths of three other Americans in drone strikes. Then, two FBI agents are killed in another botched drill. And the state of Connecticut wants to make sure you never see the Sandy Hook footage. All that in Chuck Baldwin, coming up on the InfoWars Nightly News. Welcome back. Tonight we start off with a story about a group who's, who's lately has become synonymous with uh, false flag and entrapment. And this is the death of two FBI agents. This is coming out of the HamptonRoads.com. FBI, agents died in a fall from a helicopter off of Virginia coast. Glenn McBride, a spokesman for the state's medical examiner's office, said it could be months before the staff can release a final cause and manner of death of the two agents. He must wait for the results of routine toxicology tests. And these are two members of the elite counterterrorism unit that died on Friday and uh, they, were, they were practicing repelling exercises coming off of a helicopter, and they both seemingly fell to their deaths. Um, there's been, hel you know, hel helicopter crashes are nothing new. This happens all the time. It happened 12 miles off of the coast of Virginia Beach. And what's interesting about this team, this is the, um, they call it the hostage rescue team. It's the FBI hostage rescue team. They're the government's 911. It's what who the government calls when they have a crisis. And uh, last month, it was very interesting, this team was involved in the arrest of Jokar Zarnev, a suspect in the Boston Marathon bombings. And in February, it rescued a five-year-old boy uh, who was held hostage in the underground bunker in Alabama. Remember that from the guy who was holed up in his little makeshift shelter, that they finally were able to storm the shelter and, uh, and reclaim the boy. But very interesting, uh, they were involved in the arrest of Jokar Zarnev. This story has also uh, made it to the New York Times. Uh, special agents Lorick and Shaw are believed to have died from blunt trauma, according to a senior law enforcement official who provided details based on an initial investigation by the Bureau. Everything is still being looked at, but so far this is where the investigators think we are. Every part of this is under review. And uh, both of these men had kind of worked their way up through the Bureau and had finally made it to this hostage rescue team. And it's interesting that these guys, their team at least, is involved. We, we haven't found any direct linkage that puts them at the scene in Watertown, Massachusetts, when they stormed the boat and uh, got Joe Karsarnoff. But it's very interesting, and it's, it's interesting that the day before, we reported on a story. This is from Kurt Nemo. FBI kills Tamerlan Zarnoff acquaintance. And um, his name is uh, Ibrahim. And he was an acquaintance of the deceased Boston bomber. He was killed while FBI agents were interrogating him. He was shot by the agents after midnight at an apartment complex in Orlando, Florida, 10 miles from Disney World. They said originally he was being cooperative, but he was shot after attacking an FBI agent. During the confrontation, the individual was killed and an agent sustained non-threatening injuries, the FBI told ABC News. And before he, th this young man actually died, he actually told his friends he, he felt he would be shot by the FBI. He, he felt inside he was going to get shot. Uh, one of his friends told him, oh, no, everything's going to be fine. Don't worry, but he had a bad feeling. They split these two guys up. Uh, then the FBI is just questioning Ibrahim, and, uh, well, he ends up shot, two shots to the head. And it's very interesting that we, we have no, of course, he was going to fill out a, a uh, full confession that he was involved in a triple murder that is unsolved in Watertown with some other acquaintances of the Sarnoff brothers that looked like a bad drug deal gone bad, but now they're saying the Sarnoff brothers may have been, or at least Tamerlan may have been involved. And so the FBI was going around tying up these loose ends, and then this guy gets shot in the head. Was it justice served, or are the FBI covering their tracks? I mean, you could look at all three of these stories and say, are the FBI covering their tracks? Remember the Osama bin Laden raid of uh, May 1st, I believe it was 2011. And then after that, we had a series of Navy SEAL deaths. Let's look at these now. First one, this is just a few days ago, uh, May 17, 2013, Navy SEAL dies in Fort Knox training accident. 
Uh, after the Humvee he was riding in, the Navy SEAL overturned during a training exercise. Navy officials released few details of the incident, which is still being investigated. What's interesting is there were seven other people on the Humvee, and they were all treated for minor injuries and released. Uh, going on to CNN. This is from March 30th, 2013. Official, Navy SEAL killed another injured in Arizona training exercise. A Navy SEAL was killed in a parachute training accident this week in Arizona, belonging to the same elite squad that includes those chosen to go after Osama bin Laden in Pakistan two years ago. A source familiar with the matter said. Now we go to December 24th, 2012, and RT, Navy SEAL commander commits suicide in Afghanistan. A U.S. Navy SEAL commander in charge of an elite task uh, tasked with training Afghan police has died of an apparent suicide. Commander Job Price, 42, died Saturday of a gunshot wound to the head. The cause of death is still under investigation, but military officials speaking on a condition of anonymity tell the press that Price is believed to have taken his own life. Moving on, it's, the death toll is about to get higher. Navy SEALs killed in Afghanistan helicopter crash. And this is in the Washington Times from Thursday, August 16, 2012. Seven U.S. troops, including two Navy SEALs, were killed when their Black Hawk helicopter crashed in southern Afghanistan. Um, very interesting. This, was, uh, this seems to happen a lot to these Navy SEALs. Now, here's the big one. This was back just several months after the supposed raid on the Osama bin Laden compound that we've told you here is false from the beginning. Didn't exist. You had the fake uh, war room picture. Obama was actually out playing golf. They set that up. Well, here it is. CBS News reports, 22 Navy SEALs died in Afghan chopper crash. Helicopter crash in Afghanistan uh, in the Warduk province killed 30 U.S. Special Forces Operation troops, seven Afghani soldiers. More than 20 U.S. Special Forces were killed, most of them Navy, Navy SEALs. It was reported the Navy SEALs were of SEAL Team 6, but not of the members of the Osama bin Laden raid because, you know, who knows if that raid even took place. There was some sort of operation going on. There were um, individuals who did see an operation going on. In fact, we actually played a video of somebody who was being interviewed, and he said he was watching it from his rooftop. He said uh, two helicopters landed. The guys went in. They came back out. Uh, both helicopters took off. One of them then exploded, and... They went down there and looked later. There were body parts everywhere, all kinds of mayhem. But all we heard was that an experimental helicopter crashed and that, you know, the Chinese were interested in recovering that. So you have all these incidences where people are thrown out of planes, they die in helicopter crashes. It kind of reminds you uh, a scene of, of, a, of a movie. I mean, this is just kind of straight out of a movie. Guys that are involved in these very sensitive operations, especially things that we've come out and said look like they're false flags. Well, you know, they fall out of helicopters. They get run over by Humvees. So here we see a couple of ways to get rid of people you don't like, witnesses of events, you know, throw them out of a helicopter, throw them out of a plane. Either way, they are taken care of. That was from Scarface and the Good Shepherd. And so we see these other events that are seemingly unrelated, yet the groups that these men are involved with are in very sensitive operations that we've come out and said are false flags. One being this bombing where the FBI comes out and says, who are these guys? We don't know who they are. Here's the pictures of them. Uh, yet we've been running investigations on them for the last two years. Even the Russians told us about them, but we don't know who they are. Please help us find these people. And then when we ask the FBI about pictures of other suspects, other people carrying black backpacks, people running from the scene without backpacks, we're called conspiracy theorists. Uh, our reporters have giant bald-headed freak agents run up on them and rush up to them and look at them real menacingly and tell them, I'm not scared of you, I'm not scared of you, when all we're doing is asking questions. So it just makes me wonder, you know, I feel bad for the agents who all died, but you know, when you serve a system of evil, when you serve a system that bombs women and children on a repeated basis, when you serve a system that poisons its own citizens by mandating fluoride in the water supplies and vaccines in, in, in its population, you kind of get what you deserve at, at a certain point. I'm not saying these guys deserve this, but people who do serve this system, you're going to get what's coming to you. You're going to feel the brunt of the New World Order, and you think you may be on the inside and you're going to be protected. Well, as you can see, they litter the ground with the bodies of their minions. So 
it's better to come out now and just start blowing the whistle. At least you've done something noble in the end. Uh, before we go to the next article, I just want to play, uh, John Bound put together a compilation of some of the IRS testimony, or, or should I say non-testimony. These guys do everything they can not to answer a question. And it is just amazing. So here's a, a compilation of that. You can hear some of their non-answers. But remember, these guys don't want to answer the, co the government, the Congress, yet they want you to sign a form every year under penalty of perjury that you are giving them all your financial data. Uh, I was not in, uh, directly involved in those conversations, no. Oh, but that's my best memory. At that time? And it's very vague. Sir, can I get... Well, no, you one can't one. get back to right. me. I want to know. He just whispered something in your ear. What did he say? I couldn't hear, so... I will not answer any questions or testify today. I decline to answer that question for the reasons I've already given. I will not answer any questions or testify about the subject matter of this committee's meeting. Mr. Cummings just said we should run this like a courtroom, and I agree with him. She just testified. She just waived her Fifth Amendment right to privilege. You don't get to tell your side of the story and then not be subjected to cross-examination. That's not the way it works. She waived her right to Fifth Amendment privilege by, by issuing an opening statement. She ought to stand here and answer our questions. Given their power to destroy businesses and audit individuals, do you think it would be useful for the IRS to require all of its employees to take a class studying the Constitution and Bill of Rights in order to make positively sure that they understand the concept of government restraint created at our founding? Um, I think it's very important that IRS personnel be well trained. Did you study the Constitution? You're a lawyer, are you not? Or an attorney? Um, I, I went to law school. You went to law school. Did you study the Constitution? Um, I believe I took constitutional law, but I'm not prepared to uh, take an exam at this time. <laughs> Trust has not been eroded or undermined that it's been destroyed. That trust is gone. Uh, my constituents, the people I represent, believe the federal government is out to get them. This is just so frustrating to me. You know, the whole question here is, we've heard this from time to time, just about accountability. And in all the scandals, we hear the same thing from time after time by the government officials that are involved. Benghazi, IRS, AP reporters, fast and furious. Time after time we're hearing people, wasn't my job, I don't know, it was the other office, I was recused. I didn't find out about it until you found out about it. Where does the accountability begin? People's lives are on the line in these things overseas. People's constitutional rights are at stake here. Where does the accountability begin? So there you go. They've done nothing wrong, but they don't want to answer any questions. You know, they, they want the, the, those, those rights that the rest of the citizens have, except when it comes to filling out your taxes. We don't get any of those rights because you've waived them by signing that form. And there's been plenty of uh, uh, videos and documentaries out there. Uh, Aaron Russo's Freedom to Fascism is one of them. And we've had uh, also Joe Bannister on our show many times. He was a actually armed U.S. agent, uh, IRS agent, and he's come out. Basically, he went up to his bosses and said, hey, can you tell me where the law is that says, you know, you have to pay taxes? And they said, get out of here. You're done. And, uh, and he quickly left the agency. Now, moving on to the state of Connecticut and back to Sandy Hook. State of Connecticut crafts special act to hide Sandy Hook evidence. This is from Kurt Nemo on Infowars.com. The Hanford Courant reports that the state's top prosecutor and the government's office are working in secret with the Gen General Assembly leaders on legislation designed to withhold records related to the police investigation of the incident. If enacted, the legislation will hide from public scrutiny photos of the victims, 9-11 call records, and other evidence. Uh, there's a complete agreement regarding photos, etc., and audio tapes, although the act may allow disclosure of audio transcripts, the top assistant told the Courant. Audio transcripts, well, you know, and I, I can understand them one, you know, hey, we don't want to put the photos out there of the kids. Those will end up all over the net, people, and I, I can understand those not wanting to get out. But, you know, I, I'm interested in, um, how about the off-duty SWAT officer that was arrested, well, at least detained behind the school wearing black pants and a camo jacket, or was it camo pants and a black jacket, uh, they arrested him behind the school, off-duty SWAT officer from another county. He was then later released. What was he doing back there during all the shooting? Why wasn't he running to the scene to help? Or maybe he was running from the scene. 
I don't know. What about the guns that they found in the back of the assailant's car that they also said were used in, or the assailant, the alleged assailant, uh, the alleged murderer, the 150-pound the weakling, who was apparently able to carry several guns and hundreds of rounds of ammo into the school, even though he looked like he could barely lift his own weight. Uh, those are the questions I'm interested in seeing, uh, seeing come out of Sandy Hook. And you can remember back in December, there was that Lieutenant Paul Vance video where he threatened to prosecute investigative journalists who questioned the official narrative. So there you go. Anytime you question the official narrative, well, we're going to put the, the thumb screws to you. Um, yesterday, there was, there was an attack in England where two young men attacked a soldier, hacked him up, oh, and nearly decapitated him. And uh, because of that, now we have, uh, here's an article from Paul Joseph Watson, British ministers call for mass government snooping in the wake of Woolrich attack. Politicians never let a good crisis go to waste. The so-called Snoopers Charter, a proposed database of everyone's internet and phone usage, was blocked last month by the Deputy Prime Minister and Liberal Democrat leader Nick Clegg, who cited significant reduction in personal privacy. Lord West uh, told reporters that shelving the scheme was a terrible mistake. The information is extremely important to our security services to be able to pin down people, find out who they were linked with and who radicalized them. So they're speaking of those young men there. And what they want to do is to go back in and look at everybody's phone records, phone usage, and internet usage. And then use that to either frame people or plant stuff on people. Who knows what they want to do with it. But it's not going to be good. It's not going to be noble. And they never let a crisis like this, oh, so one soldier's been killed. Now we have to spy on everybody. Do you see how it's, we're not going to go after these two young men. I think one of them ended up even being killed in the shootout. One of them was arrested. But we're not going to go after those people. We're, we want to snoop everybody's Internet usage and find out who radicalized these guys. Who knows? I mean, they should go to the Brixton Mosque. That's where w we have uh, actual MI6 and CIA uh, agents, assets coming out of. We have the shoe bomber, Richard Reed, who came out of the Brist Brixton Mosque. Uh, Anwar al is connected to that mosque. So is uh, 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 Nadel Hassan the Fort Hood shooter. And all those guys connected to Al Alawaki, including the underwear bomber. And later we're going to get to uh, a video of President Obama uh, talking about Al Alawaki. So there you go. Uh, moving on to the Wall Street Journal, U.S. stocks shake off global market route. So you're beginning to see what has happened is um, the stock market has basically got to where it was before 2008, before that first crash. And now we made it just back up to that point and we're about to go back down. Uh, it's it's going to happen. Don't worry. Mark, mark my words. It's going to happen sooner rather than later. Uh, comments Wednesday by U.S. Federal Reserve Chairman, Chairman Ben Bernanke in minutes from the Fed's recent policy meeting suggested that the Fed might start pulling back on bond purchases sometime this year. That's where they're going around just pumping money into the economy that they print out of thin air and loan it to us at face value plus interest. That made investors fret that the flood might soon be tapering. That's the flood of the, all that free money. And dovetail with weak Chinese manufacturing data to send the Nikkei index tumbling 7.3%. That is Jap Japan's stock market. So they had uh, you know, a 7.3% sell-off, which I'm sure the insiders sold their stocks before the sell-off happened, so then they can go back and buy the stocks and make lots of profit off that. Moving on to Obama in the New York Times. Obama in a shift to limit targets of drone strikes. There you go. I guess he's killed all the people he's wanted to kill. President Obama plans to open a new phase in the nation's long struggle with terrorism on Thursday by restricting the use of unmanned drone strikes that have been at the heart of the national security strategy and shifting control of them away from the CIA to the military. And also, we're going to use them domestically against you. Don't worry. We're going we're gonna to we're gonna be flying the drones here domestically. Use them against the American people. Yeah, that's pretty good, huh? I like that one. Um, lethal force will be used only against targets who pose a continuing and imminent threat to Americans and cannot be feasibly captured, Attorney General Eric Holder said in a letter to Congress, suggesting that threats to a partner like Afghanistan or Yemen alone would not be enough to justify being targeted. But that wasn't before they killed, well, first it was one American, then it was his son, then, well, now it's, it's four Americans. 
Um, in a letter to congressional leaders, Holder confirmed that the administration had deliberately killed Anwar al-Awlaki, a radical Muslim who dined at the Pentagon right after 9-11. Don't forget that. Uh, he died in a drone strike in September of 2011 in Yemen. Mr. Holder also wrote that the United States forces had killed three other Americans who were not specifically targeted, targeted one of those being Alaki's 16-year-old son. None of these people had a trial. None of these people were arrested. None of these people were even told they were being accused of anything. They were just killed. And that could happen here. Now they're going to have drones flying over here. Uh, Rand Paul had to do a filibuster just to get them to say they wouldn't go out and start killing Americans with them. But, you know, they send guns to Mexico. Uh, the IRS targets conservative groups. They tap the AP's phone lines and other senators' phone lines. Uh, I mean, other representatives' phone lines. The representative coat room was being tapped. Um, these guys don't really follow the law as it is. So what makes you think they're not going to use drones against American citizens on U.S. soil? Well, it'll happen, and we'll be the ones to report it. And we won't whitewash it like the rest of the mainstream media. We go now to our quote of the day. This is from George Mason, his remarks on annual elections. In all of our associations and all of our agree agreements, let us never lose sight of this fundamental maxim that all power was originally lodged in and is co consequently derived from the people. And that is the first half of our show today. When we come back, Alex Jones will be sitting in this seat and talking with Pastor Chuck Baldwin, who came to our studios today to be interviewed on the radio. He's also going to be in the latest film that we're going to release. We're finally releasing another one. I'm very excited about that. We're going to be combing through all the interviews that we've done uh, over the past few years that never made it into films. Um, we got kind of sidetracked with other things like producing a nightly news show. But now we're going to go back to the long form, produce some amazing documentaries, getting back to that, and continue on our quest to get the truth out to the people who deserve to know what is going on. But in order to do that, we do need your help. We'd appreciate it if you're watching this on YouTube and you're not a member of PrisonPlanet.tv to please become a member of PrisonPlanet.tv today. You can go online right now. It's PrisonPlanet.tv. You can get a 15-day free trial. You can watch as much video as you want. You can share your username and passcode with up to 11 other people, even more actually, but only 11 of you can be online at once. But you can watch the radio show, all the nightly news, you can see all the great interviews we've done and put up there, all the movies, documentaries, Alex's book, Paul Joseph Watson's book, Alex's rants, I mean, it is loaded. Tons of information in there for you. You can download it, you can spread it around, you can do what you want with it. Just please become a member and help us out today at PrisonPlanet.tv and we'll be back after this short break. Many anthropologists and archeologists believe that before man even discovered uh, the power to harness and use fire, we were involved in agrarian activities. That is taking the seeds of plants and then replanting them to produce more. The very foundation of our modern civilization and human culture is centered around the planting and cultivation of edible plants, fruits, vegetables, nuts, you name it. And the globalists have been going after gardening. They've been harassing people that have gardens in their front yards or their backyards. They've called for licenses for people to have gardens because you can't trust prisoners in the police state America to be able to grow their own food. That's why I've come to the realization that we need to become self-sufficient. You need to be informed, you need to have the Second Amendment to protect yourself, you need to be politically active to wake up others, you need to filter your water, but you also need to plant a garden. Even if you live in an apartment, you can do this. If you live in the countryside, obviously you can do it on a grand scale. There are so many green belts in areas uh, that humans don't even visit uh, nearby cities and in suburbs where people are now more and more planting their own little private gardens and meadows and off the side of the road. Ladies and gentlemen, it is a revolutionary act to unplug from the television, to unplug from the computer and all the globalist propaganda and to go out in your backyard or your front yard or planters at your apartment or on the roof of the building where you live and to plant a garden. Here are some of the amazing deals at InfoWars Seed Center at InfoWarsShop.com. The Survival Seed Vault by My Patriot Supply features only the finest survival heirloom seeds for a robust and hardy garden, even in the toughest of times. 
The ARC All-in-One Seed Kit contains 70 varieties of 50,000 seeds of fruits, vegetables, medicinal, and culinary herbs. All ARC seeds are heirloom. Each type is labeled and sealed separately for ease of use and longevity. The Deluxe Emergency Seed Bank combines three of Emergency Seed Bank's top sellers. The Family Survival Emergency Seed Bank, the Medicinal Herb Seeds Pack, and the Culinary Herb Seeds Pack. We also have starter varieties of the Deluxe Seed Packages for fruit, salad, salsa, peppers, and medicinal herbs and more. Go to the InfoWars Seed Center at InfoWarsShop.com. A little seed can grow a huge tree that produces fruit for up to 50 years. We have the best life bombs. That's what these are. We have the best weapons against death out there at the lowest prices waiting for you to lovingly plant them and lovingly grow them and lovingly eat them and share them with others. We will strike back against the New World Order and this is only one more initiative in our fight against them. So please join us at InfoWarsShop.com or you can link through at InfoWars.com at the InfoWars Seed Center. And welcome back to this Thursday edition of InfoWars Nightly News. I want to thank Rob Dew for doing a great job on the news portion earlier. And in studio with us uh, for the second time today is Pastor Chuck Baldwin, uh, who is one of the leading uh, liberty constitutionalists uh, in the country. Uh, in fact, when MIAC and Homeland Security came out with reports four years ago uh, demonizing people, they said were dangerous extremist uh, leaders, it was Ron Paul and it was Chuck Baldwin. Now, I've been listed in many of the other reports, but I was kind of upset that I was not listed as horrible and evil by them because uh, the Southern Poverty Law Center, uh, who basically helps write those reports, and the ADL are really wicked organizations. Uh, in fact, I'm going to cover it more tomorrow, but they put out a, a big national story. It's all over the place that I said the uh, tornado uh, in uh, Oklahoma City was the government. And, and they'll only report on it more now that I'm debunking them because they think it's getting to me. No, actually, it, it's, it's, it's getting to them. It's discrediting them because my audience is bigger than their audience. They just have bigger, fancier studios like the Emperor's New Clothes. Uh, when callers called in about weather modification, and I, and I had a guest on about weather modification and the history of weather warfare, we said it could be, but probably isn't. But they are doing secret programs, so you never could say it. Uh, they're already manipulating the weather so much, who knows? And they had Senator Whitehouse come out just uh, earlier this week and said, we don't want to help Oklahoma because you didn't help support carbon taxes. We're sick of paying for you. You know, your, your coal power plants caused this. So he's actually saying the victims did it. And they're like, absolutely. The, you know, the Oklahomans, the Midwesterners, uh, uh, they're all bad. Literally, we played that clip earlier in the week. I'm going to play it tomorrow on the radio show. And then they shifted gears uh, from there and said, no, 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 Alex Jones is saying Obama uh, and the government did it. And, of course, they edited all the audio. Media Matters, run by the White House, did not put out a video because it would have been clip, 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 obvious. They put it out to make it sound like I was saying black helicopters did it. When I was explaining that high-altitude aircraft mo modify large weather fronts and low-altitude aircraft uh, from people I've interviewed and, and the classified stuff, they can create tornadoes, but it's very hard to do. So I was getting into the science of weather modification and weather warfare from the father of weather weapons, Ben Livingston, uh, who was doing weather modification from World War II up until today. He's 90-something years old. And they took an hour of information, boiled it down to a minute to lie to you. And the good news is, why are they attacking Infowars.com? Why are they attacking yours truly? Because we're effective. And you know why we're effective? Because we're real. I'm unpolished. There's no teleprompter here. I got my guests in here to talk about other issues, but then I remember, oh yeah, there, this is a big national story now. I need to fire back and respond. But it's really a teaching thing. When no weapon used against us will prosper, as the Bible says. And I've, the older I get, the more I realize the Bible, that's where it's at, all the knowledge right there. When you're trying to do right, doesn't mean I'm perfect, everything they do basically ends up bouncing back against them. And I've got a bunch of issues I want to talk about with Pastor Chuck Baldwin of uh, ChuckBaldwinLive.com while he's here and talk about his two books, uh, the newest one that's out that is such an important salvo of truth against the globalists. But just hearing me break that down and seeing some of the news articles and clips today, uh, you know, while you're here at the InfoWars studio, what do you make of their intensified uh, desperateness 
against myself, Matt Drudge, Rand Paul, and uh, Ted Cruz, and of course they're attacking you some as well. I mean, there's not really that many of us, but we're effective and it's scaring them. What do you make of what's happening? Because it's, it's, it's big medicine, as they say. I, in fact, I'm in the opposite of a power trip, Pastor. It kind of freaks me out to be getting as much attention, but it's so ham-fisted and so deceptive at the same time uh, I think it's going to backfire on them. What's happening right now? It's great to meet you in person. You bet. Great to meet you. You've got a great staff, great studios, great operation. Thank you very much. I think it's, I think it's typical. Anytime someone such as you, me, Ron, Rand, Ted Cruz, and anybody who will have the courage to speak the truth, what it does, it, it, it shames them for their dishonesty. And they hate that. So they will do everything in their power to discredit those who are telling the truth in order that they might have a monopoly of information to the American people. The problem is what you said is exactly right. Every time they do this, it backfires on them and it draws more people to our message. The more they attack us, people will be out there. Some people that don't know about you, don't know about me, they'll hear this and they'll go, well, what? What's this Chuck Baldwin guy? What's this Alex Jones guy all about? So then they'll, they'll check us out. They'll go to the internet, they go to the radio, whatever. They'll check us out, they'll listen, and they'll go, wow, this guy's telling the truth. Every time they do it, it just increases sure. the amount of information that people receive from us. So, well, Hardball and MSNBC last year did a documentary on the Tea Party, and, and, and I was heavily featured in Ron Paul, and they actually took a clip of him on my show out of context about the Founding Fathers and said that Ron Paul wants violence when everybody knows it's the opposite. Right. And, and it backfired because everybody knows Ron Paul. Exactly. And, and they knew that was just pure bull. But right. it's their nature, though. You know, people seem to think that good people have no power and that evil is just in charge of everything. And, yes, evil tends to get in charge because it's ruthless and wants the power. But can you talk historically and biblically I mean, a, a little bit about the fact that there are different forces in this world? Mm -hmm. It's not just evil. We tend to just abdicate and just, oh, well, that's the way it is. It's the right. end of the world. Right. Yeah, if, if that was the case, then uh, the founders would have never done what they did. Uh, I, you know, I think you can make a great case for the fact that they were never a majority. But they, they were a tireless minority who would not be satisfied with anything other than the prevalence of truth. A very small minority. Absolutely. And, and they prevailed. And the reason they prevailed is because they were able to, with the, with, the, with the truth on their side, speak to the hearts of the American people. And that's, that's the thing that the, these globalists fear more than anything. The reason they fear you, Alex Jones, the reason they fear Chuck Baldwin and Ron Paul and people such as us, is because we preach the truth. They cannot stand the truth. The, the, you put the truth in a, it, truth is like a light going on in a dark room and all the roaches are scurrying for the corners. It, they, they can't stand the truth. We're talking directly to the people. We are bypassing the mainstream media. They used to have a monopoly on the information that people heard. They don't have that monopoly anymore. The internet, the technology has evolved. You've got these studios, you've got your radio show, you've got what you're doing right here on video. You're putting this stuff out 24 hours a day. They can't control that. So no longer do they have a monopoly on what the American people What are, are they going to do next then? I mean, they've got, I had Bloomberg on, uh, 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 Bloomberg uh, Business Week magazine was yeah. doing some feature piece. Uh, and I'm sitting there telling them things and they're giggling and laughing. And I'm like, don't you get it? You are losing your credibility every day. I, I, I just want to have a free country. What do you, because I hope they keep being arrogant, but I think they're starting to lose some of that arrogance. How are they going to counter strike against us? What keeps you up late at night? What do you wake up at 2 a.m. worried about Chuck Baldwin? I guess the only worry that I have, Alex, is that maybe I won't do what I'm supposed to do and I won't be faithful to do what, what God's called me to do. I, you know, I, I, you know, I'm a great believer that there is a creator God who, as Benjamin Franklin said, governs in the affairs of men. And I don't really care how powerful uh, the enemy might think that they are. We, we, you and I both know that there's a God in heaven who is the ultimate power of the universe. I have a responsibility to him. I want to make sure that I'm doing my job. I want to make sure that I'm doing everything that I can do. That, that's my concern. 
my favorite my, my favorite quote is, is is John Quincy Adams: "Duty is ours, results are God's." And I, I justice be done, may the heavens fall. I, I, I truly believe that. So you know, I think it's actually I sit back and I, I'm kind of amused when I hear what these people are doing and what they're saying. Like they're taking that clip of yours about about the hurricane, about the tornado. I mean, and they're trying to twist that. It's kind of humorous because it shows you how desperate they are. They're desperate to try to discredit someone that they know is reaching the American people. Well, I used to joke around more on air because it's, it's hard to be serious all the time. Just cause it, and, and they'll take that and twist it. So I've got to just be, I mean, I've joked around before and, and you know, made a sarcastic statement. Yeah. And then they'll put that out now, yeah. really yeah. abusing their audience. Because I make mistakes when I do. I like to come tell people so they know, hey, you know, I want you to know that, you know, I made a mistake here, but they just, they, they revel in, you know, it's funny you mentioned that. Here's my next question for you, and then we're going to talk about the book. Guys, can you search engine, Schmidt, uh, head of Google, Schmidt says, don't be evil slogan was stupid, and I think it was a S Sunday Times of London piece, came out a few days ago, but it was also in other places, but he was on TV over in Europe. There's even a video of it, but you can just pull it up so I can show people. He said... When I took, you know, when I was at Google uh, near the beginning, I told them this don't be evil uh, was stupid. Yeah, there it is. Uh, Schmidt, don't be evil was stupid. And he goes on to say, well, there really isn't any evil. Uh, he said, he said, sure, the Bible says there isn't a book, but don't be evil's dumb because there is no evil. Really, is somebody that grabs a four-year-old girl out of the back of a uh, uh, backyard and takes her and rapes her for two months and tortures her? Yeah. And, and uh, is that evil? And so what I've noticed is they always say there's no good and evil, but then when they want to take our rights, they tell us what morality is, or they say we're going to hurt somebody's feelings politically if we say that lifestyle is dangerous. Uh, so so th they are saying there's a morality, but it's their morality to tell us how to live. But if we ever say right. we have a view or we have an idea, now if people complain to the TSA, they have a talking point like, I don't want you groping me. Okay, Mr. Conspiracy Theorist. So, like, if I said I wanted chocolate ice cream instead of vanilla, and all they were serving was vanilla, they'd say that's a conspiracy. They're actually saying our free will is bad, and, and, and that it doesn't exist, that we're just animals, just a programmable thing. But the truth is they know there's a free will. Yeah. They want to get rid of it in program. So that's my preaching. You now can look out there at the camera. Uh, which one is on him right there? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, for the next 20 minutes or so and get into free will, where the world's at, where it's all going, where you think it's going, and how you think we defeat it. The state of the world right now, not the state of the union, the state of the world, the state of the spirit with Pastor Chuck Baldwin. Wow. That's quite an introduction. Thanks, Alex. I think the battle that we are facing today is, is a battle that's been going on since the world began. Uh, and that is the battle between will man be free to be governed by God or will he be subdued and governed by tyrants? Uh, William Penn said, if a man is not governed by God, he will be ruled by tyrants. And I think that is the, the ultimate battle that we are facing. It's, it's, a, it's got a modern face, uh, new names, uh, new context, but it's, it's, it's an age-old battle. It, it goes back to the Tower of Babel in the book of Genesis, when mankind, the, the, those who would be tyrants among us, decided that they would create a global government. Now we know what God thought of that because he supernaturally judged it uh, and, and set forth the precedent for all of the world to see that there was only one sovereign and that it wasn't God, I, I mean, excuse me, it wasn't government, it wasn't uh, the president, it wasn't the Supreme Court, uh, it wasn't the, uh, uh, the CFR or uh, any of these global organizations. The only sovereign is Jesus Christ. And, and of course, our founding fathers understood that. And they really truly believed that man must be free so that he might be governed by God. And that was the whole philosophy behind the, the, the War of Independence. When that first started... Of course, the crown decided that they were going to subdue the colonists, and they did this through several mechanisms, not the least of which was the attempted confiscation of their firearms 
uh, at Concord, Massachusetts. Now, a, a, a citizenry that is incapable of defending itself cannot be a free people. It is absolutely critically important that free people keep and bear arms. The founders knew this, which is why whenever the Crown sent their troops to Lexington, that Pastor Jonas Clark's male congregation at the Church of Lexington were the ones that stood on Lexington Green in the, in the pre-dawn hours of April 19, 1775, with their muskets and stood in front of the British troops, about 800 in number. Uh, the Minutemen numbered about 75. This took place right in front of the church house where those men worshipped every single Sunday. The British troops saw the men standing with muskets, immediately opened fire, eight men died instantly, returned fire in self-defense, the shot fired heard around the world, the war for independence began. The rest is history. How did that happen? That could not have happened except that Pastor Jonas Clark and the other colonial pastors at that time preached and taught and explained the principles of liberty, the principles of freedom, natural law, revealed law to their congregations so that whenever the tyrant was exposed as such, they knew where to draw their line. They understood the jurisdictional authority that God has given to all men, all man made, all man authority, all men's authority is jurisdictional in nature. It's limited in scope. God is the only sovereign. He is the only one that has uh, full kingship authority over our lives. So the, the battle has always been, will men be free to be governed by God or will they submit to the tyrannical reign of, of those who would usurp the authority of God? Now even non-Christians, even non-Christians must have the freedom to either choose to worship God or not. And that is central to our understanding of freedom in this country. That's why we have uh, this uh, uh, sacrosanct doctrine that we believe that all men are free in the matter of faith and religion. And there is no theocracy in America. We don't have uh, a government saying that you will worship God this way or you will go to this church or you'll be baptized in this manner or you'll take this catechism or whatever. It goes back to the natural law of freedom that men have to be able to uh, allow God to govern them according to their understanding of Holy Scripture, etc. Without that, you're reduced to tyranny. You're reduced to despotism. And I think that's the battle, Alex, that we're facing today today. God's trying to make you free so you can choose free will and develop as your own person. But the globalists and throughout history, they're always trying to become God, act like God, take your free will to make you a slave. I mean, and, and, and then atheist people should get this. Even if you don't believe in God, saying that my rights come from God that are common sense, okay, now no government can be above me. But the truth is, uh, I said you got the floor, but you're absolutely right. I just wanted to add this. Right there is the crux of it because be, they're really going after everybody's free will and they want the state to be God. I think they see the state as God. I, I think they really do have a God complex. And, you know, here's the thing. If you reject God individually, uh, you're going to replace that with something. And a lot, of these, a lot of these people that we're talking about, these globalist types, I think have rejected the authority of God in any shape, manner, or form. And as a result, they see themselves as God, or at least the combination of everything that they're able to accomplish as God. They're, they're doing God's work because they're building a better planet. Uh, they're making life better for us. They're making life more secure for us. Uh, after all, we need their protection. We need their assistance. We need their sustenance. But that's their so mid-level minions. I we're, we're at, the top. God. They're at the top, what really makes you believe in God, and, and again, not even the way they twist it in things in the media, is that I've studied the globalists. You get to the t final level of the New World Order, they're a bunch of Luciferians. Oh, I don't doubt that a bit. I, I, I well, don't break down the bit. biggest threats and how we defeat them then and talk about the book. Yeah, I... Well, for Christians, for those of us that know the Lord as our Savior, uh, obviously we have to be able and willing to take our stand under Christ for those principles and those truths that we know to be right. We cannot abandon the field. We cannot run from the battle. We cannot pretend that this fight does not exist. We cannot pretend that we do not have a responsibility 
for, our, for our, the sake of our children and our grandchildren to resist that which we know to be evil and to promote that which we know to be right. That's the first thing. We have to accept personal responsibility for our duty. I love John Quincy Adams' quote, duty is ours, results are God's. And that's the truth in every area of life. We only have one thing to do, and that's to do our duty. Let God take the results. But we have a duty, and we cannot abrogate or run from that responsibility. Uh, the thing that the books you referred to, my son Tim, who's a constitutional attorney, and I, I have written a couple of books that we think are, are just absolutely critical for, for, this, for this time in which we live. Romans 13, The True Meaning of Submission, uh, is a, the first book that we wrote. So many pastors and Christians uh, teach and are taught that we are supposed to obey the government no matter what. Uh, unlimited submission. Obey Stalin. Uh, anybody, whoever government is. That, that is so contrary to the teaching of Scripture. They use Romans 13 in the first seven verses of Romans 13 to try and justify that. What we did in the book is we go into the entire Bible, Old and New Testament. We show the complete scriptural teaching on the subject of submission to human authority. What we find, of course, is that all human authority is limited. It's jurisdictional, as I said a minute ago. That there's only one sovereign, that's Christ. And, and if that, a government goes against, just reading your book, but also common sense, natural law, if the government goes against the common law, the common sense, then it's null and void. I mean, if it says, give your right. children to the fires of Moloch, right. well, the Bible says, give not your children to the fires exactly, of Moloch. Exactly. It's saying, don't follow the government. Exactly right. If you were to take out all of the examples of Scripture, of God's people resisting evil government, you're going to take away a vast, a vast, percentage of the entire scripture. I mean, from the beginning, from Abraham all the way through the New Testament, from Moses who, who resisted and, and rejected that, uh, the attempted murder of a, of a Hebrew slave there in Egypt by a taskmaster. He stepped in and by force defended that man from harm and was then praised in Hebrews chapter 11 for doing so and became the great deliverer of God's people. All the way from Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, all of the prophets who withstood the kings, pointed the kings, uh, fi the finger into the king's face and said, you know, thus saith the Lord, to John the Baptist who pointed the finger at Herod the king, to Simon Peter who said we must obey God rather than men, to the apostle Paul, the man who wrote Romans 13, who spent half of his life in jail because of violating some law. And Christ could have knelt to the Pharisees, but he didn't. He whipped them. Oh, absolutely. So Romans 13, The True Meaning of Submission, was our first book. The, the second book, the one we just came out with, To Keep or Not to Keep, Why Christians Should Not Give Up Their Guns. And again, our viewers know a lot of this, but you need to read this to really have the facts. They're right. so well written, right. so historical, and then give them to pastors. Right. This book on, on the Second Amendment, this is not from the Constitution. This is not from the Second Amendment. This is not from uh, a, a, a historical, philosophical, political point of view. This book is written expressly from a biblical point of view. It's for Christians, mostly, to help them understand what the Bible teaches about the right to keep and bear arms. Jesus said, break the law and carry the assault weapon of the day. You're referring to what Jesus said in the book of Luke right before the Garden of Eden, excuse me, the Garden of Gethsemane. And as, as they were getting ready to go to the Garden of Gethsemane, where Jesus was going to be betrayed, arrested, and then eventually crucified, he told the disciples, he commanded them, if you don't have one, sell your clothes and buy a sword. The disciples responded, there are two swords here. So two of the men were already carrying swords. One was Simon Peter. We know that because he's the one that cut off the guy's ear in the garden. The other was probably Matthew. Regardless, there were two swords already being carried. Now, what you're referring to is, in the Greek word there, the, the, the word for sword is the same word that is used in Romans chapter 13, where it says, he, speaking of the civil authority, government, uh, bears not the sword in vain. It's the same word. He's referring to a military type weapon. The Roman sword was the most efficient and effective self-defense tool in the world at that time. It would be the equivalent of a modern day AR-15 type rifle for, for modern Americans. So Jesus instructed the disciples, A, go buy a military type weapon. B, the military type weapon that he told them to go buy was illegal. 
for them. Oh, to I've read the histories of Josephus. They a lot of times crucified you for having that sword. They were a subjugated people, the Hebrews were. They were not allowed by the Roman government to carry a Roman sword. That now, was for their safety, though. Well, and we know what it was for. Uh, being sarcastic. Yeah. No, they, they had seized and conquered them. That, right. A exactly conquered right. people are disarmed. Exactly right. That's for their safety. But see, now the other thing about that is, in the, in the garden itself, whenever they came for Christ, Simon Peter felt confident enough that he was doing the right thing to try and defend the life of Jesus by taking the life of a soldier that was coming to arrest him, that he drew his sword and tried to do so. The man ducked and cut off his ear. Jesus put the ear back on in a healing, told Simon Peter to put up his sword. He didn't tell him to give up his sword. And then he said, they that live by the sword die by the sword. And we go into all this in the book. That, that does not mean that anybody who defends life with, with a rifle or a handgun is violating the law of it's God. It's clearing. If you go out and live by taking things with a sword, exactly you're right. going to end up getting it. Well, well it's kind of, they, you know, they lie about, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I've, I've told you this a lot. And of course, preachers are on record uh, you know, on it. But look, it says thou shalt not murder, right. which means go kill an innocent person. It doesn't say thou shalt not kill. The right of self-defense is a God-given responsibility and duty that God gave to mankind from creation. Let me give you an example from Genesis. When God first created man, he gave him a couple of, uh, only a few commands at the very beginning. The first one was to procreate, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. Bring forth life. She God's given us good stuff to do. <laughs> the, only, the only command, by the way, the only command in the Bible that probably the man has ever broken is that is that first one. But then right after that was, he said, if, if a man shed man's blood, by man, by man shall his blood be shed. Okay? So God tells us two things. He said, first of all, the responsibility to, to bring life into the world. And secondly, to protect life. So the duty and the responsibility of protecting life is sacred. Well, it's very libertarian. It's saying, do not offensively for no reason go attack somebody, but if someone attacks you, defend yourself. Exactly right. It is a duty. It is not just a right. I had a Christian write on my Facebook page here recently and, and said, I can't believe it, something very outlandish. He said that, that owning a firearm was a privilege granted by government. He claims to be a Christian. Uh, it was a privilege granted by government. And if government wanted to take it away, as a Christian, we have no right to, to say no. He doesn't understand that the right of self-defense is more than a right. It is a duty. It is an obligation. Well, what's happening is so many of these people never went through adversity, never got mugged, mm -hmm. and they're just literally, like in England where the, you know, the, the uh, extremist cuts off the guy's head, and everybody for 20 minutes for the cops because they're standing around talking to him. I, well, I mean, I would at least be getting away from a guy who's out there, you know, with a meat cleaver cutting heads off, much less like, oh, I mean, they just, they don't even get threats. I, I think it's even deeper. I, mean, I, read, yeah. I mean, I read about women who get grabbed, yeah. and they don't even fight back, or they like, get yeah. in the van, and you, I mean, I would fight for everything to not get in the van. Yeah, but I think from, and, and our discussion point here, Alex, I think the problem is so, so many Christians for so long, for at least 50 years, may, maybe longer than that have been indoctrinated in this, in this philosophy of, uh, of pacifism, th this philosophy of unlimited submission. I mean, the, the pastors just beat it into them and beat it into them. But it's them. okay for the military to go around doing yeah, all this. exactly. It's okay. In fact, they're the biggest cheerleaders for war are the evangelical yeah. Christians. Send your sons out it's, in it's, immoral wars to kill it's people. Okay to kill as long as you're in uniform. Yeah. But if you're an individual defending yourself, your family, someone else. That's what Piers Morgan said. Buzz Bissinger said, let's kill Alex Jones. And then the woman. Yeah, I heard that. And, and then they all said in a uniform and they like yeah. fetishize right. the power of the state. Very sick. This is and because and, 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 they, they literally hate the individual. Right. They get, I mean, I would feel embarrassed if I had power or something because I was part of some large mafia. I mean, I do feel satisfaction in being successful individually. I just don't get it. I mean, what is it, what is it in my spirit from my entire life that wants to see people empowered and that also hates bullies? Because I don't get how people don't have the animating contest of liberty. How it, like Ezekiel, or, or who was the prophet who said, it's burning in my bones, they're going to kill yeah, me? Jeremiah. It was Jeremiah. They're going to kill me, but I can't shut up. Right. And people say, Alex, will you ever sell out? That's what people say, I've sold out and make stuff up that I'm CIA or this or that. I couldn't sell out. They could put a gun to my head and say, hurt some child or do something evil. And it's not that I'm a hero. I can't do it. 
I feel guilty that I don't work hard enough and that my flesh is weak and that I don't fight them strong enough. It's funny, I asked you, what do you fear? You said, I wake up worrying I'm not doing enough and I'm not pure enough, and that's my fear. Yeah. Like, I'm not worried about getting killed. Out of fear, I'm worried I won't get more perfected. I won't get a good report. Yeah, I, I, I think that you, first of all, just thank God that you are as you are. Uh, because we are all dependent upon God. I mean, he delight thyself in the Lord, he shall give thee the desires of thine heart. So thank God you have the desire in your heart to do what it is you're doing. I mean, I, I look at people and say, how can you not fight? How can you not resist? How can you not take a stand? I look at my pastor brothers, the ones who are up there preaching this social gospel, preaching all this pansy-wansy stuff where that, you know, nobody takes a stand, don't say anything controversial. And I say to yourself, to myself, you're, you're a watchman. God has given you a, a, a position of trust and responsibility and influence where that your voice affects so many people. And, and going back to your other question, I think the problem is, is so many pastors have numbed the, the congregations that they don't have that burden of, of defense and liberty and life. They've... You know, the same, the, all this is in the book, the same law that allows us to defend ourselves individually as a, as a, as a society also is, is, is the same law that, that should protect unborn children. Think about this. You've got a lot of pro-life people out there that march for life and, and they contribute to pro-life organizations and they're involved in trying to overturn abortion on demand and they, they cry out for the unborn and rightly so. And we're I'm winning right, that battle. I, and I'm right there. Every but time it, we fight, we win. But here's the thing. My, here's my comparison. If you and I don't have the right to defend ourselves as grown adults, if we don't have the right to fight for life, if we don't have the right to fight for, our, uh, for the lives that we have, then how, how, what wow. right do we have to fight for the lives of the unborn? That's a point I never thought about. How that is cheap. Because imagine if I'm in a parking lot and a guy pulls out uh, you know, a sigh, the grim, because that's what they use on a baby, and is trying to hack me up, do they say I don't have a right to fight? Right. Because, because they're going to try to fight for the unborn. Right. And, and so the government has the right to come and kill us and, and subject us to all kinds of tyranny uh, and, and murder and mayhem, et cetera. The state says and kill babies? The state says do it, so it's okay. So, that we, so why do we... So why? they should do Romans 13. That's right. That's right. They Romans should 13. kill... You know That's what? Right. You know, Romans the, 13, they should let the babies die. The, Romans 13, they should let the government kill the babies. Why do, they, why do they support the right to life groups? Why do they get involved in pro-life organizations? Why do they give money? Why do they, why do they beseech the... Yeah, just say, it's the end of the world, let them die. Well, no, it's God's will because the state so ordered it so it's God's will. Let me ask you this question. Wow, that, that's powerful. Wow, I've, that, I've never even, uh, that, 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 that is a powerful angle. The truth resonates. When you know truth, yeah. when you hear it. I mean, uh, then expanding on that, when they say that, you know, it's okay to kill babies, now the Journal of Bioethics, as you know, a year ago came out and said, well, let's kill kids up to age three, mm -hmm. even healthy ones. Right. And I put that out, just like the Mac report saying you were basically a terrorist and Ron Paul was. For a few days, Ron Paul was like, really, Alex? Really? Until the feds admitted it. Yeah. I mean, you, you believed me when I called you. Remember oh, I called yeah, you? Yeah. And I said, hey, they're saying you're a terrorist. Yeah, you're like, really? Send that to me. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, but you, you, Ron Paul was like, I got you him on the... You broke the story. Well, well, the point is, even Ron, but you, Ron Paul was like, Alex, really? So I got to hold him on. He's like, hey, really? I said, yeah, you need to get me, Ron Paul, to call his assistant. This is real. Got it to him. He was in Lake Charles at the time. And then he got it. He made calls. He wouldn't. And then, like four days later, they said it was real. Everybody's like, "Oh, we apologize. It was right. real." But well, we sent a letter. We we sent a letter, and we signed it, and sent it off to the to the officials in Missouri, and demanding an apology. And that's whenever. And of course, millions. After you put it on your show, I wrote a column on it in my syndicated column. It went viral. And, and, and the people in Missouri, they were inundated with hundreds of thousands. Exactly. But the reason calls. I tell that story is. Paul Watson's the official journal of, of, of bioethics, it says this. It took people a week to think we hadn't run a hoax. When there was a link to them, there was a link to them. People, that's what I'm saying is it's so over the top that that people are in denial. You know, it's like that uh, abortion doctor that just got... Yeah. Um, Gosnell. Uh, yeah, Gosnell, that's an oxymoron, doctor, killing babies. He, you know, these are babies that there's some waiting lines to adopt them. They're nine months old. Mm -hmm. He's killing them. He's making jokes about them. It's, it's, you know, it's, 
the place is filthy, women are dying in the clinic, and people are upset about that when it's just so obvious it is children. And but, the duty, and the duty that we have to protect life. No, Romans 13, the government see, says it's good. See, that's, that's the thing. And that's where people aren't thinking. They're, they're, they're not... Isn't it just the ultimate cop-out of incredibly lazy people, preachers and their flock, who just don't want to be challenged when it was the preachers that helped end slavery, it was the preachers that helped... I mean, it's always been the real preachers that helped drive towards that. I, I think if they you know, get before Christ, God's going to say, you know, you said you know me, but I don't know you. What motivates uh, people? Is it... Is it is it fear? Uh, is it, um, I think there's, I mean, I, I grew up in, in the fundamental evangelical Christian church. I, I mean, I was with, you know, I was with Moral Majority. I, Jerry, I was, Jerry Falwell was my mentor. I would, you know, I've been to all the big meetings. Most of these guys that we know publicly I've been with, have spoken with, been on the same platform with. I've been there my whole life. And you said, I, knowing them, they grew up in the 30s and 40s. They were, they were really just naive. I, 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 really, I, really think, I really think it went back to a statement that, that, uh, that one of those men made back in the early 1980s, back when the Christian Coalition and the Moral Majority were just getting started. And what he said was, and I, and I was there when he said it in Washington, D.C., he made the statement, all we want is a seat at the table meaning the king's table, and they got it. They got it. Uh, after and now they, they get tax funds. And, and, now, and now that they've been there, they will do anything and everything to keep their seat at the table. And, and I hate to cut it to that, to that much. But that's a seat at a puppet table to begin with. Well, it's, it's a, it's, it, it is, you've, when, you, when you do that, you have sold your independence and you have abandoned your calling, in my view. As, as a pastor, Alex... Well, now I've, they're out calling for guns to be turned in. I've, yeah, I know they are. I've, I've, as a pastor, my responsibility is to preach the truth the best I can understand it without fear, without favor. That's my duty. That's my calling. If I allow a, a government institution or a faith-based initiative bribe or uh, a, a, an invitation to a, a White House or a, or a governor's mansion dinner uh, or whatever the perk might be to negate that calling where I am supposed to declare the truth, am I really God's man anymore? anymore? Am I really the watchman? Am I really the shepherd anymore? Or have I become a hireling? I preached a message not too long ago on the difference between a shepherd and a hireling. And you know, the Jesus said the shepherd gives his life for the sheep. He's willing to fight the lion and the bear. What does the hireling do? He runs from the bear and the lion. He's not willing to give his life. Why? Because he's a hireling. He's not really a shepherd. He's not committed. He's not really a shepherd. He's not even on a team. I think the, the people out there that have these pastors, and it, it took me a long time to say this, and this may sound short, but the Christians out there who, ha who go to these churches and their pastors will not take a stand, will not tell the truth. They, they will not engage the enemy. Or they will, as you said, pastors get up and expect their people to turn in their guns if the government asks them to do so, the clergy response teams and all these things. Or they go, they go along with it. I really think it's time that Christians start voting with their feet and leaving these churches and finding some pastors that will take a stand and support them. I mean, if you want a pastor to, to take a stand, then you support the pastor that's taking a stand. Yeah, I have family that have been going to a church for about 10 years or longer, and they've taken the old preacher out. It's, it's a big church, brought in new ones, and it's like Bill and Melinda Gates, New World Order. Mm. And one family member left it and will not go. And the other teaches Sunday school and goes, well, at least I can get down here and give them, they haven't gotten down to me yet. And that, that's kind of a quandary, you know, does, does the one family member sit there and still give good teaching to the little kids? Or because the church at the top is, I mean, it is like total new world order. Right. What would you do in that? I would leave the church. I would leave the church unequivocally. And I would find a pastor that will preach the truth and I will help him in that church. And I will teach Sunday school 
to those children, and I will help that congregation, and I will encourage that pastor. There's a lot of pastors out there. I've got uh, a black regiment list on you know, black regiment. That's uh, the pastor. Explain that to people. Okay. In, in the War for Independence, the, the British Crown concocted the title the, uh, or the moniker of the Black Regiment. It's referring to the, the, the colonial pastors that were preaching independence. And it had freedom. a double meaning. Anything black meant bad and well, accursed. Yeah, well, it meant the black, the black robes. No, they, no but it had the were, double meaning, yeah, too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The black robes they wore in the pulpit, and so they called them the Black Robed Regiment or the Black Regiment. But these were the preachers, like Jonas Clark, who stood up in the pulpit and taught the principles of liberty that motivated and inspired the people to fight for freedom and independence. But So a few years ago, back in 2007, uh, I was studying history, and I, I came across that again, and I thought, wow, we need to resurrect that today. So we put out an appeal through my website, through my column. Great and, idea. And, yeah, and we've got over 700 pastors on our black regiment list right now. They go to ChuckBaldwinLive.com. So if people are looking for a good preacher in their area, there could be you one. got 700. There could, there's 700 there. That Man, I've gone to so on. many churches where I can tell the people are loving and good and yeah. have a good message, mm -hmm. but then you can tell because they don't even like it when they give the government message because they've been, right. you know, and I mean, it's like, ooh. Right. It's so if you find one, if you got a pastor like that near you, okay, maybe his church isn't as big. Maybe it's not as ornate. Maybe it doesn't have all the trappings, you know, but if he's putting out the truth, then get in there and help him and go shoulder to shoulder with him and stand with him. I mean, he needs help. He needs Sunday school teachers. He needs deacons. He needs elders. He needs, he needs officers in the church. He needs workers. He needs children's workers, teen workers. He needs people to help him. So if the people that believe the truth would support the men of God that are preaching the truth, how much more effective could we be? Plus, it would put on notice all of these guys out there that are unwilling to preach the truth. Look, the people want the truth, and they're not going to sit and tolerate well, it if you don't get And again, it. people, because of Hollywood, Schwarzenegger, you know, the archetype uh, of the, uh, you know, superhero that goes out, the Hercules that defeats the Hydra, in truth, defeat of tyranny is little steps, mm -hmm. and it's little people, many hands make light work. I want people to know, they're like, well, how do I start? Or they always try to have some grand plan, or they want me to help them start something. Just start small, do the right thing, uh, you know, Duty is ours, consequences. Uh, God's. Absolutely. I mean, it's, it, it comes down to that. It Just is. do the right thing, the world will change. Exactly right. And none of us can do it all, but everybody can do something. And all right, I, closing comments. People should get both the books, InfoWarsStore.com, support you, support me. But, 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 I mean, you know, b b books don't even really support us. The point is this info are weapons of truth to, to destroy mountains of lies. It, and a grain of truth can destroy a, a mountain of lies. Go to InfoWarsStore.com. Get the book, Romans 13, get the book to keep or not to keep. Get both these books with his constitutional lawyer son written with Pastor Chuck Baldwin. Give him a day. Two-minute closing comment right there, whatever's on your heart right now. Well, first of all, Alex, thank you for what you're doing. And those of you that are watching Alex, you need to support him if you're not already. Uh, it's, it's like supporting a pastor that's going to preach the truth. You need to support the guys in the media that are going to tell the truth. You need to support the people in government that are telling the truth. Uh, support the people in business that are telling the truth. We got a, a list of businessmen on my website at chuckbubblelive.com. We call them patriot businesses, and we've got several of them uh, that you can support if you live in that area. So you need to support Alex Jones. And, and the books, yes, will help the support of Alex and the show, uh, but more than that, it will give the information and the truth that is needed to combat all of these lies that have been going on for the last 50 years or more. The Romans 13 book, uh, what the Bible teaches about true submission to authority, this, the new book, To Keep or Not to Keep, Why Christians Should Not Give Up Their Guns. I believe this book, and I really mean this with all of my heart, Alex, I believe this book, if it could get into enough churches and pastors, homes and hearts, it could change the course of the country. Why? Because the churches have the power to change the course of the country. They always have had, they always will have. This book can revolutionize the thinking and the philosophy of pastors and Christians all over America. It will help them to understand the biblical principles of freedom. It will help them understand the biblical principles of liberty. They will know the jurisdictional authority given by God. They will understand what is and what is not tyranny. They will understand what is right and what is wrong when it comes to resistance. I've had so many Christians that have come to me privately before we wrote the book, and they said, you know, Chuck, I know you're right about the Second Amendment. I know you're right about keeping and bearing arms, but where does the Bible say that? 
I've, I've never heard my pastor say anything about it. I've never been taught this. Where do I find this in the Bible? Show me. This book shows you in the Bible where that's found from Old and New Testaments. Hundreds and hundreds of scriptural references in that book. You will have the, the scriptural tools at your disposal, at your fingertips, that you'll be able to talk with anybody, anywhere, anytime, intelligently about what the Bible says about the right of self-defense. So I encourage all of you to get the book, support Alex, support the other patriots that you know are out there in whatever field that they're in. And if we work together, I believe with all of my heart that we can see victory in this country. Alex, I don't believe that God is finished with liberty in America today. I don't believe No, it. our metal's gonna be tested. We're, we're living on the work of others that fought for freedom Absolutely. before us. Pastor, uh, we're gonna end the show right now and I'll, I'll get you back to your hotel and fly you back to Montana uh, you know, in the morning. But uh, just stay right there, I'm gonna end the show. God bless you, it's great to meet you in person. Nice to meet you, Alex, thanks very much. You know, I, folks, I'm gonna be honest with you. I don't watch many preachers online because it, it's so watered down. The, and and it's, I don't say that in some arrogant way, it's just true. But we watch uh, almost greedily uh, by Monday or so when it gets on YouTube. I didn't even know till I talked to him that it's streamed every Sunday, 2.30 live at ChuckBaldwinLive.com. Maybe that's something we should start getting on PrisonPlanet.tv for the folks. You know, pick up your feed and put it out that way or archive it. The point is, is that it's good to have somebody you can learn something from. And I learn a lot from Chuck Baldwin. And I've encouraged him to start, but he needs the support to do it. And he said he's actually thought about that, you know, obviously. Uh, a seminary and you never know people you touch and things you do you may give this book to a young person who's going to go to Bible college or seminary you may give uh, this information or, or pass this video on to someone who's a pastor a priest whatever it is I don't a rabbi whatever to get them thinking about the real animating contest for Liberty I mean there were people like Howard Phillips, who just passed, who uh, Pastor Baldwin had the a eulogy of, who now, I didn't even know who he was until about 16, 17 years ago. But later I learned that was somebody who did things that led to things that happened that woke me up. Yeah. And so you never know, like ripples in a pond, who you're affecting, who, who you're getting to. Let's say you got 10 copies of this book and gave them to preachers in your area randomly. I'll guarantee you one or two of those preachers are going to wake up because of this book. And that's someone who's going to reach hundreds, if not thousands. It might be some small preacher who's reaching 100 people a week right now. But I'm telling you, the way God works, the, the, you know, uh, as Martin Luther King said, the, the, the universe uh, bends towards justice. And that's just the way it works. God smiles on the righteous. And the biggest thing the world will do is you know, tell you you're evil, uh, you know, uh, good people are so guilty about the bad things they do that they'll never be a leader, and then they'll let the totally wicked run everything. Look, none of us are perfect. Just get out there, start doing something. Uh, you know, pray to God to help lead God and direct you against these people, and nothing will happen but doors opening. Every time I've not submitted to tyranny and not compromised for worldly gain, doors have just flung open. Every time I've passed thresholds of fear and threats, and just trusted in God. I take the step, God has taken me the rest of the way. And I'm telling you, this is the great challenge. The mark of the beast, the new world order, genetic engineering, nuclear war, you know, you know it's all written and you know it's all coming to pass. We're on a planet, it's gonna go up to 10 billion people, it's gonna be hell on earth in many areas. But through that great crisis, we will awaken billions of people and then the real, true age of human liberty will begin under God. And that's why the globalists call it the new age, because they create the counterfeit, ladies and gentlemen. Everything the devil offers you is a lie and a fraud, a cheap copy of what the creator of the universe is offering all of us. And again, it's time to break your conditioning. It's time to break the slavery of the new world order. It's time to wake up and get involved and take action, because this is the great animating contest for liberty. This is what you were born for. This planet, all of it, is only a spiritual test for you and the rest of eternity. And again, the enemy tells you all day that's not true and that they're atheists. That is a lie. They serve the God of this world. They sold out for temporal power on this planet. This planet is very small. And that's why they're so scared of this information. That's why they don't want us to talk about it, because it's like nails on a chalkboard, because they know they got conned. They know that they sold out to the God of this world. 
They know they sold out to the little G God. They know they've been conned, and they're doubling down and committing, thinking if they can kill unborn children and other innocents and kill leaders and kill people of God, that they're going to win. But I don't fear he who can kill the body. I fear he who can kill the soul. But evil people kill themselves spiritually. They decide to go on the losing team, and God simply damns them, cuts them off. I'm doing a little bit of preaching here at the end. But ladies, the media calls me the preacher. You know what? I'm just somebody that loves liberty, ladies and gentlemen. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Great job of the crew. I salute the entire crew. We'll be back tomorrow, Lord willing, 11 a.m. Central for the radio show, and back tomorrow night with InfoWorks Nightly News. Again, we want to thank the entire crew and all of you, the viewers and supporters of this transmission. And if you are watching this transmission, you are the resistance.